This is Stephen Hilda's last skydive. The straps on his parachute have been cut. He's falling 13,000 feet to his death. Everybody was in the frame to begin with. The forensic evidence is entirely consistent with suicide. He did not take his own life. He's dead and somebody did it. It was the end of a week-long skydiving competition. But for Stephen Hilda, the day's skydive will end in tragedy and spark a police investigation unique in British crime history. hadn't been brilliant through the week. We'd done a few lifts on the Wednesday, I think two, three lifts on the Wednesday, that was about it. Um, and the Friday had started off exactly the same as the, the rest of the week. Then early afternoon, it was apparent that we'd be able to get one jump in, so we started to prepare for that. This is footage filmed on the day of the competition. The three-man team are all officer cadets in the army and experienced skydivers who've each made over 200 jumps. Adrian Blair and David Mason are both 19 and Stephen Hilda is 20. On the minibus we were just laughing and joking around with one other team that was going to be jumping before us. Skydiving instructor Paul Hollow was in charge on the day. I have a list on the ground so I know who went in the plane and I know who I expect to come out the plane. At 13,000 feet, the competition starts when Paul gives the go-ahead. On the ride to altitude, we were just focusing on what we were going to be doing on the jump, um, going over things in our head. Before getting out, we just gave each other sort of a handshake, a high five, sort of a good luck sign. Charlie Oscar DZ, uh, clear running, clear drop. I had given the aircraft uh, clear drop, so a couple of minutes after that, the aircraft dispatched the parachutists. We climbed out of the plane and exited as a group. We started turning the different formations really fast was probably one of the best jumps we've done together. We all had eye contact, we had a big smile for each other, and because we knew we'd done really well on the jump. And at about 4,000 feet, we broke off, we got some horizontal separation so we could activate our own parachutes in clear airspace. At this point, the cameraman loses sight of his fellow skydivers in the clouds. And then out of the corner of my eye, I saw some white material, which made me think that something was wrong. It was just sensory overload at the time. I didn't really register what was happening. On the ground, Paul was also puzzled. He could only see two of the team's parachutes, which are easy to spot because of their bright colours. He thought the last skydiver must have had a problem and used his white reserve parachute, which is harder to make out against the clouds. I dispatched uh, one of my instructors and a, a volunteer to go and pick up what I thought was a parachutist who'd had a, a malfunction and was then landing underneath the reserve. I radioed out to them and said, um, has anybody seen the final canopy? Nobody had seen it, and yet everybody else had landed exactly where they were supposed to land. They asked me if I knew who it was, and I was able to tell them it was Steve because I recognised the distinctive colours of Dave's parachute. 
and also Tim, our camera guy. So I knew that they were both okay and that it had to be Steve. One of the guys radioed in saying, I, I found it. So I said, you found what? He said, I found the reserve parachute. If the reserve parachute wasn't attached to a skydiver, then something had gone terribly wrong. They now knew they were searching for a body. We basically stood on the car, and the crops at the time were quite long. It was just before harvest time. So we saw an indentation in the crops. Myself and the other instructor, Tony, went to investigate. Seeing a body laying there, particularly under those circumstances, is not what I would wish on anybody. I was in shock, but when you skydive, you realise that it is such a high-risk activity sometimes that you do always prepare yourself for the, that the worst could happen. But this was no accident. I could not believe what I was seeing at the time. I, I hesitate to use the word sabotage, but there had been some kind of um, damage inflicted on that parachute before it had been used. Paul noticed that the straps on the parachute had been cut. He called the police. When I first got on the scene, I was told straight away that, it, that uh, the parachute had been deliberately cut, so the potential of, for murder was there immediately. Officers had never come across a case like this before. They took the unusual step of asking a skydiving expert to help collect evidence. The police asked my colleague and I to put some white coveralls on uh, and a mask and, and obviously some gloves. We then, under their instructions, took samples from parts of the equipment. Approximately an inch and a half of the webbing is what the police required as a sample. Officers started to search for other clues. We searched the bins, the roofs, and other parts of the site looking for knives or other sharp implements which could have caused the damage to Stephen's parachute. We inspected every piece of kit on site to make sure that nobody else has been tampered with, and unfortunately it hadn't been. The murderer could still have been at the scene, if indeed this was a murder. So it was very important to get DNA from everybody at that scene and from anybody who had been in contact with that parachute so we could compare the two. The police took DNA samples from everybody, myself included. Um, so, yeah, I guess everybody was in the frame to begin with. Two of the most important witnesses that we had to see were, were, his, were his diving colleagues, David Mason and Adrian Blair. They'd seen him during the day, they'd seen his equipment, they'd been on the flight. Potentially, they could tell us an awful lot. Towards the end of the first interview I did on the day, I found out that the straps on Steve's parachute had been cut and that they were either looking at a suicide, but more probably a murder investigation. Twenty-year-old Stephen Hilder fell to his death skydiving in the summer of 2003. Got a knock on the door during the evening on the 4th of July and there were two policemen on the doorstep and you, you can tell that something, something's wrong. Unless you've lost a child, I don't think anyone can understand what that feels like. And to not know why it happened or exactly what happened, to be in this situation where there's no sense to it either, if there ever, ever is any sense in losing a child, um, it's, you can't describe it but it changes your life and changes it forever. Stephen's death was the result of an act of sabotage. The straps on his parachute had been cut. I don't really remember what went through my mind at the time. You're just in such a state of shock. But certainly right from the beginning it made no sense that someone would want to do this to Steve. 
And within hours of his death, the entire country was aware of it. A skydiver who fell 13,000 feet to his death in Lincolnshire yesterday has been named as Stephen Paul Hilder. This was the 20-year-old's final jump. His parachute had been sabotaged, its cords were deliberately cut. Police strongly suspect he was murdered. The media interest in, in what happened to Steve is obviously something we'd never experienced before. And it's very difficult when you open a newspaper or turn the television on the radio and completely out of the blue your son's being talked about. Every single channel was just showing a picture of Steve saying skydiver murdered. And I couldn't think of a, any motive why anybody would want to take his life. All that could go through my mind at that time was somebody was either targeting a skydiver, um, yeah, any skydiver, or they were after a, an individual but got the wrong man. Stephen's girlfriend, Ruth Woodhouse, had been told about his death while on holiday. It was only later that she heard the murder theory. I was on the way home and started getting signal on my mobile and it started beeping and beeping and beeping and I got all these messages like from loads of people and then we got to a service station and it was on all the papers in the service station. There was my face on the papers and it, my face had actually been in the papers before I knew about it. Detectives hoped the media coverage would throw up a new lead from the public. At the same time, they were getting briefed on the mechanics of a parachute. Skydiving instructor Paul Hollow was their guide. Now on a normal skydive, when we want to use our main parachute, we grab this little handle and we pull out a little mini parachute that's inside here. So this is what we call a pilot chute. This then catches the air and acts as our anchor in the sky. As we fall away from this anchor, the bridle line, this piece of black tape, pulls out all the way up to this main pin here. The bridle can then pull the pin, which opens the flaps of the container, and then the rest of it pulls out the parachute for us. Just in case things don't quite go according to plan with the main parachute, we can grab the handle on the other side of the pack here, which we use to deploy the reserve parachute. This has a cable going up from the top here. It goes over the top of the parachute. It comes straight down to another pin. So as soon as this pin is moved, the flaps can open, and this white bit that you see here is the top of a big spring that jumps out and acts in exactly the same way as our main pilot chute. It grabs the air and acts as our anchor in the sky and pulls out the reserve for us. Here, a skydiver releases a faulty main parachute and opens the reserve. But both Stephen's main and reserve chutes had been sabotaged. Here, then, we have the main pilot chute. This had been pulled out, and what must have happened is they pulled it out and they then cut the bridle. They'd just fold it back up and put it back inside the container. So now, when you go to throw the pilot chute away, that's exactly all you're doing. You're throwing that away, but because the bridle had been cut, it can no longer pull the pin. If the pin can't be pulled, the flaps stay closed, and you can never, ever have the main parachute come out. And he tried to use the reserve, and he pulled his reserve handle. The reserve parachute did deploy. He pulled the reserve canopy, out of the container and started it deploying but unfortunately the reserve was no longer attached to him here are the rises of the main parachute okay underneath those we then have the bits of strapping that go to the lines of the reserve canopy itself and these had been cut so it was as if somebody had put scissors or a knife or whatever had been used to cut the risers about there and had then closed the flap over the top of them. There was also a backup device which would automatically release Stephen's parachute if he didn't open it. He'd activated this device before the jump, but because the straps to his parachutes had been cut, it was to prove useless. Stephen had done everything to save himself.